Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about prototypes and structures in Arcanum. I did the previous talk on how we did procedural generation in Arcanum, and now I want to talk about how we actually stored objects. Uh, that was a question several people had. And then related to the procedural generation, I mentioned that uh, buildings were done a little differently, so I'll, I'll explain that too. So before I can explain how prototypes work, I kind of have to explain how objects work and even why we did prototypes, which was basically to save memory. Back in the late 90s, there was not a lot of RAM on PCs and we had to conserve literally every bit. So in the game world, anything you saw in the game scene that wasn't a background tile was an object. There were 18 object types, which are Walls, portals, portals are any kind of door. Containers, which is anything that can hold an inventory. Scenery, projectiles, weapons, ammo, armor, gold, food, scrolls, keys, key rings, written objects that aren't scrolls, generics, PCs, NPCs, and traps. We grouped those 18 objects into different categories. So when I say critter, I mean a PC or an NPC. When I say an item, I mean a weapon, ammo, armor, gold, food, scrolls, key, key rings, written, and the generics. And then mobiles are projectiles, containers, critters, and items. Mobile doesn't mean it moves on its own, but mobile means that this is an object that we expect to have its location changed during the game. And then finally, there were consumables, which were food and scrolls. Consumables are anything that when you use them, they're gone. Now, all of those objects had fields inside of them where we stored data. Some fields were in every object. Those are things like their art ID or their location or their hit points in AC. We gave every object hit points in AC in Arcanum just in case we wanted to you know, make an explosive that could destroy scenery or there was a spell that targeted a container and if it wanted to damage it, we weren't sure. And as when I explained how we did prototypes, you'll find out it was better to put them in and then have them never change than to not have them at all and then need them later. So some fields are very specific to an object category. Uh, or, or group of object types. For example, for portals and containers, you might have lock difficulties and key IDs. So this is the key ID that opens this lock and here's how hard this lock is to pick. Inventory exists inside of containers or critters. Some fields were only in one object type. So ex items are a good example of that. Only items in the game had weight, had value, had a parent, which is because items can go into inventory, they can point to the parent object. So every object in the world pointed to a prototype. And so the way that worked was we would make a prototype for some object. Let's say we had the prototype of a knife. This would be a weapon object. And then we'd have an art ID for a basic knife. You'd have a damage range, maybe one to six for the knife and what damage type it, it did. And how much it weighed and how much it cost. And all those values were filled out in a knife. If you ever found a knife in the game, it would just point to the prototype and say, I'm this. And then anything that was different in that particular object from the pro from the, its prototype would then be stored on the object itself. Things like some things always were stored, like the location, because you knew that was always going to be unique for every item. Some things were stored frequently, like current hit points. That was something that it was, when you first found an object, it probably didn't have current hit points. So it just inherited it from the prototype, which is probably it had full health. And then as soon as it took damage, it said, nope, now I have a field that overrides the prototype. There are some things on items like charges for magic items or inventory in creatures and containers that were stored as a delta, of course, from the prototype. You don't want every container in the world to point to the same set of inventory. The reason we did that 
was there are then fields in, I'm sorry, bit fields in the object that says, here are the, of all the fields that could possibly exist in the prototype, here are the fields we're overriding. So if you had an object which was identical to its prototype, it would point to a prototype and then its bit field bits would all be zero, which, and, and then there would be nothing stored after it. If any of those bits were one, it meant the corresponding field was in the object stored in order. So that made it very, very easy for us to have a lot, a lot of objects in Arcanum, but not take up a lot of space. If you had a hundred knives in the game, most of them only really need their location and their current hit points and their parent. So they would have three fields and everything else, there wouldn't be anything else stored. So they'd say, if you want to know about me, get it from my prototype. And we'd load all the prototypes whenever the game loaded. And then for objects, objects were stored by whatever sector they were in. So when we loaded a sector, when the player entered it or got near the sector, because we didn't want the there to be a delay if the player walked too close to another sector. So we preloaded sectors as you walked around. These objects would get loaded in, but they were very small. And what was great about that is you only loaded this very small object. You didn't really have the data. It's just when whenever anyone asked for it, if something said, hey, I need to know this, I, this knife's hit points, you'd go, here's the bit field for hit points. It's a zero, so give the prototype's hit points. Or it's a one, and it's the third one we saw, so go to the third field in the object, and that will be its current hit points. This worked really well. Uh, Mark Harrison, one of the programmers, did the majority of the heavy lifting on this. Objects like this not only meant we had less, we used less RAM in Arcanum, but our save games were smaller too. I do know that when people tried to mod the game, they were a little aggravated because the way objects and prototypes were interrelated made it hard to understand. But wow, did it help us when we were making the game. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about with procedural generation, I often talked about buildings and structures worked differently than almost any other object that was in the world. And the reason for that was the way you made buildings or structures, because um, I'll talk about like dungeons and caves were also structures. They were made usually in top-down view. So let me explain how that worked. The game is normally isometric. You, for any st structure you wanted to make, there was a floor, wall, ceiling grouping, meaning the artist would say, here are the floors that go into the structure. Here's the basic wall type. Now, there are lots of wall subtypes. There are corners and where a window would go, there's the left part, there's the center part, and there's the right part. I'll explain that in a second. And then there's a ceiling. That would be stored. For a dungeon or a cave, you wouldn't have a ceiling because you want to see all of it. The way you would draw one of these is you'd switch to top-down mode, which would still do the... We still had the same numbers for all the tiles, but they were literally not at a 45-degree angle. They were done top-down. And then you just draw a rectangle, and that's the house. If you drew another rectangle it would merge them. The perimeter of all of these rectangle or merged rectangles were the outer walls. And we would know what, you know, do an outer corner or an inner corner, because those are different corner types, and then walls along the perimeters. If you had a rectangle drawn and it already had all the walls around it and you drew another rectangle that intersected it, we would remove all those walls in the intersection and just do the ones along the perimeter. This did mean that if you wanted to add a interior wall later, you had to go in and do it by hand, but those were easy to do and didn't take much time. The If you wanted to add a door or a window, what you did is you'd go back to isometric view and now you can see your house and you would click either on the door or the window and then you click on the wall and it would add a door there or a window. And for windows, it put a window where you clicked and then put the right closing part of it and the left closing part in the wall segments on either side. So that you couldn't put a window in a corner, which was good. Couldn't put a door in a corner. 
if you put then another window next to it, it just extended it. So you had a longer window. So window, window, and then the bracket parts. And you could do that all along, all the way up to a corner. Doors were similar. You could put down a door. If you put a door next to it, you're not a double door. If you put down a third one, it would check to see if there was a triple door. If there wasn't, it just didn't put anything. So if you made a double door and you tried to make it a triple door, you may not be able to, but you could always go replace this with a wall and then click over here. And now your double door is here instead of here. This worked really well. It let us make buildings super fast. We laid out to rant really quickly. But what was really good is because dungeons work the same way, when you made a dungeon map, you just made the entire background, the solid rock background we had, which I think was a, a bluish squiggly thing. And then you would just draw in like, here's a hallway and it would put in the, the walls. Here's a room. It would delete the wall segment at the end, put in the perimeter of that room and the connector would be empty or that you could just walk right in. And then you could go back to ISO and put a door there. So this worked really well because we could make dungeons very quickly. Remember, there were only like a dozen people on our canum, So this was super important. This let us make any kind of structure, a ruin, a building, a dungeon really, really quickly. The and, and caves worked the same way. This let us put it together really quickly with one person doing a lot of these things. I think all the artists eventually made levels, but one person could make an entire dungeon level really quickly. Then you just went in, and when you were back in isometric and you put the doors and any interior walls you wanted, then you'd place the props. You'd you know, place bookcases and tables and chairs. So this made the levels quick, quick to add. And because everything you were putting down were objects that had prototypes. If you put down a table and a bunch of chairs, nothing had to be stored other than this is the location this is in. That There was a table out there, a prototype table that stored all the important stuff you needed to know about how the art ID and everything about that table. This worked really well, especially for, because you did the floor and our footsteps depended on the floor texture, it was very easy to change your footsteps when you walked into a structure because you knew you were within the bounds of the structure and you knew what the floor was. And the floor had like, is it wood? Is it stone? Is it metal? And you could get the corresponding footstep out of that. Structures also overrode the lighting. So if you were outside and you went into a structure, you were now inside and it knew also not to do the lighting using the outdoor lighting. It would use whatever the structure had as lights inside of it. This worked really well for us. I know people who tried to mod Arcanum later were a little frustrated, but both objects and their prototypes and structures were designed to minimize memory and make it possible for a dozen people to make the zillions of maps that we had in Arcanum. So I hope this, you know, tickled your interest and it brought to light some of the things that we did in Arcanum that was kind of cool.